Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the second presentation of our fall webinar series, The Power of PEA Harnessing Your Endocannabinoid System to Combat Pain, Inflammation and More, presented by Dr. Paul Herkel, ND. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. There will be a complimentary sample awarded to those of you attending this live session. If you would like to receive your free sample, please provide us with your phone number and mailing address in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen in the control panel. There will also be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, time permitting. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so through the throughout the presentation by typing it into the question box in the control panel at the right side of your screen. Please note this presentation is being recorded for future dis distribution. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Herkel. Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Cassie. Um, it's, it's a real honor to be here talking to you about uh, I think a topic that everyone's super interested in. Uh, it's definitely something that everybody um, really wants to know more about when it comes to cannabinoids and the endocannabinoid system. So, you know, I'll jump right in. Um, obviously, the first things first from a housekeeping perspective uh, is that we um, we are obviously anything that we talk about isn't meant to be um, the advice of the doctor. Uh, and obviously, you should check with your healthcare practitioner before you take anything uh, that is um, that's not recommended, uh, natural doctor or uh, your medical doctor. Okay, let's uh, let's jump right in here. Okay, so just a little bit of an overview. We will be talking about the endocannabinoid system. Uh, and I'm going to start with giving everybody uh, an overview. Now, this is a very complex topic. It's, it's a topic that's now just being explored in the research, and we are getting new insights all the time. So our goal is to give you uh, an overview of that, especially in the context of how actually we can leverage it to have that therapeutic effect. We talk about and we hear about all sorts of different forms of cannabis, and now we are going to be talking about something called PEA, and I'll talk a lot more about that. So don't worry about that right now, exactly what it stands for. But we'll talk about all the unique features of it. We'll talk about how it fits into the endocannabinoid system uh, that is actually complementary to something like cannabis and hemp products. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about what the ECS or endocannabinoid system is. So the ECS is present throughout every tissue of the body. You can see here in this, in this graphic, uh, there is anything from the liver to the immune system, to our adipose tissue, to our muscles, to our nervous system. It exists through the whole body. And a good way to understand our ECS is that it is a key regulator. And that's what the term homeostasis means. It keeps things in balance. And this is a system that we, up to uh, you know, a couple uh, years ago, we didn't know too much about. Uh, we obviously knew about cannabis, but we didn't really fully understand how we can possibly leverage all the benefits of this. And when you start seeing how it actually works in the body in repair, recovery, and protection, it'll be very clear to see how we, um, we have a very, very promising therapeutic uh, target here. So those are some of the targets. These are actually some of the functions of the ECS. Um, anything from learning, memory, the health of nerve cells. We'll talk about how CB1 receptors are primarily found in the central nervous system. Pain and inflammation are huge. When you think of cannabis, you think of the endocannabinoid system, you know, pain, inflammation, sleep is a really, really uh, top three key indications. But there's a lot more than that. Um, there is uh, appetite control, digestion, energy metabolism, bone health, reproductive health, and many, many more. Uh, we'll focus on, I think, the top ones, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so this is, as I mentioned before, this is a little bit of a, a dense topic, so I'm going to try to make it as easily understood as possible. Um, there's a number of key players when it comes to the ECS that I think we need to understand and I'm going to introduce you to. Uh, so this diagram here shows two of the key molecules that are found in the endocannabinoid system. There's something called AEA or anandamide and 2-AG. And these two molecules are what the body produces itself. They are true endocannabinoids and they influence the endocannabinoid system. And then there's a number of receptors. There's a number of enzymes that are being targeted. You can see here CB1, there's also CB2. This is a diagram of two different nerve cells. One of the things that the ECS does is that 
it regulates the secretion of neurotransmitters, the communication molecules between nerve cells. And it typically acts as a balancer and as kind of like a calmer. It's probably a simple way of thinking about it, but it's probably the most accurate. It's all about regulating this particular, uh, this particular communication. There's also a number of key enzymes, and I'm gonna introduce these to you as we go in the most relevant areas. Um, but there's enzymes that are involved in the production of these molecules as part of the ECS and also in the breakdown. And then finally, the CB1 and CB2 receptors. So CB1 is primarily found in the central nervous system and CB2 is found in the immune system. Now they're found all over the body, but these are the two key areas. And you can just think about if these are where these particular receptors are found, this is probably where they're gonna have their beneficial effects. So typically CB1 receptors are gonna be modulating things like pain and CB2, which is on the immune cells, they're gonna be modulating things like inflammation. We know that inflammation is produced and regulated by the immune system. And then over and above CB1 and CB2, in the last 10 years, there's been a number of other receptors that have been recognize that are, that are part of the ECS. We used to think it's you know quite simply simple, CB1, CB2, but there's actually a lot more. There's these orphan receptors, the G protein receptors. Some experts believe this is, should be classified as the CB3 receptor. Um, there's the PPAR receptors. Uh, there's the alpha and the gamma versions. Uh, there's the uh, TRP, these are, um, uh, these are particular receptors that regulate the transmission of electrolytes and, uh, through, the, through the cellular membranes, they're in the vanillinoid class. But this receptor is also better known as the capsaicin receptor, and we've all heard of that as um, using creams that have an anti-pain effect. Um, so both the PPAR and the, and the TRPV1 receptors are really important when it comes to pain. And then finally, other ion uh, like calcium and, and and potassium channels. There are, so, there are also are other endocannabinoids that, uh, and, and PEA, which is what we're gonna be talking about, falls into this class. There is PEA, there's OEA, and SEA and LA, and so on and so forth. And these, these molecules, these fatty acid amides, they are produced by the body, and they also regulate these receptors that we just talked about. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go, because we're going to obviously focus on PEA specifically. And so the, the, once we get to the point that there's so many different receptors and so many different enzymes and targets, we start discussing this just like the microbiome. We talk about it as the endocannabinoid odome. Basically, the, the whole encompassing family of receptors, and, and I really love this I love this diagram here because it shows you in the middle, there's CB1 and CB2, but it's more than just that. We often get very focused on the cannabinoid receptor because that is, you know, CBD is all the rage right now and cannabis and hemp products, but it actually is way more than just the cannabinoid receptors. In fact, actually the vanillinoid family receptors are at the center of it, as well as the G receptors, uh, the G protein. So, all of these receptors represent a whole class uh, and a whole world called the endocannabinoidome. Okay, so obviously you can clearly see this is a place where we can really have a therapeutic effect. And this is, and this is what I wanna explore for the rest of this presentation is that the ECS is can we target it without even going down the cannabis, uh, cannabis external cannabinoid route. Because one of the key things to understand, and this is what this diagram shows, is that when you start looking at any sort of system and trying to attack it therapeutically, you have to understand that there are going to be effects you want and there might be effects that you don't want. So right now we're very focused on CB1 and CB2 receptors, but if you get very focused, as very, which is typical in the, in, the, in the pharmaceutical world, you're very focused on one receptor, you start having some undesirable effects as well. So you can see here clearly addressing CB1, CB2, this is in the central nervous system. So this improves things like nausea and vomiting. You know, we've 
heard of that before using cannabis for that. However, on the flip side, we don't know the effects on potentially affecting GI function or inflammation. So if we just focus on one receptor instead of multiple receptors or that whole family of the endocannabinoid system, we may be missing out on some therapeutic effects and we might have, be having some negative effects down the line. So I want you to keep this in mind when you're considering uh, something called PEA. So PEA stands for palmitol ethylene amide. Um, and it, it really is something that AOR is super proud of because it's the first in Canada. This product has been uh, this ingredient has been known for a long time. We'll talk about the history, but it's the first time that's available in Canada. And um, our founder, Dr. Traj Nibber, uh, was really excited when we found this particular formulation and this particular ingredient. And it, it's been really, really well received by both our healthcare practitioners, by our patients and customers, and by our retail partners. So back to this diagram, Look where PEA fits in. It's one of the key players in this endocannabinoid system, and it works on multiple receptors. We'll unpack this in a couple slides, but it is one of the key players, and you can see that in, in the diagram. Um, it is part of ECS and it's produced all over the body. It's produced as needed. You'll see that here coming up. One of the, the key things to understand about the way that chemicals work in the body, the way that molecules work in the body is that when a molecule looks very similar, it's going to have a similar effect to molecules that have a similar shape. So in the middle, in the, in the, green, uh, in the green layer here, you're going to see the endocannabinoids. These are molecules the body's producing to specifically bind to CB1, CB2, and the whole family of receptors. But then you go down to the pink, uh, pink layer, you're going to see PA, OEA and the other fatty acid amides, your, the, the molecular structure is actually quite similar. And this is very important to understand because this is, this is going to help us understand why a molecule can have uh, an effect on a receptor, even though it's not the exact molecule that's meant for that receptor. So how is PEA made? Well, it's actually part of our cellular membrane. Every single cell in our body has this cellular membrane made up of fatty acids. And you can see here that there is this enzyme called NAT, PLD, and what it does is that it liberates palmitolethylene amide, or PEA for short, and that is what is going to produce that beneficial anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective, and pain relieving effect. So it's kind of like having your it's kind of like having your, uh, your relief molecule right on site. As soon as the cell gets damaged, it can be produced on demand and ready to go. Uh, and then there's enzymes uh, like FAH, uh, fatty acids, amide uh, hydroxylase, uh, and it is the one that breaks it down. So the body's making it and breaking it down almost instantaneously, and it's being produced as needed. What causes it to be produced? Well probably from what you've already seen so far, you can guess that any sort of knee stress, both psychological and physical, infections, chronic inflammation, acute inflammation, pain, allergens, any sort of, anything that damages the body, for example, like a sunburn, pesticides, chemicals, even foods that we eat that are producing an allergic response, any sort of stressor the body interprets and perceives PEA is going to be produced. The endocannabinoid system is going to be activated. This is really important to understand because it helps us, it helps us grasp that PEA is a go-to molecule that's being produced on demand. And when you look at PEA, um, a couple of this was summarized in that, in that complex chart, but I want to just really unpack. There's four key mechanisms of action. Number one, it reduces the inflammatory process. Think of it as a regulator. We know that the old school way of thinking about inflammation is that inflammation is here, I just want to block it. Well, what we now know is that inflammation is produced for a reason. It's produced because the body's trying to heal something. It is a signal for repair. Uh, and then that, that inflammation is not meant to be suppressed, but it's meant to be regulated and balanced. And so think of PEA as a key regulator. That makes sense. It also activates certain specific unique cellular receptors. We've met some of them. The vanillinoid family, the capsaicin one, the PPAR alpha, and the G protein. We'll meet them shortly. 
in a little bit more detail. Uh, and then it enhances overall endocannabinoid activity. We'll talk about that. And then finally, mast cell activation. This is one that we'll circle back to when we talk about allergies and we talk about neurological function. But this is a really important one because mast cells are more than just for allergies. They play a key role in regulating the neurological system. So this is more for the geeky, uh, the geeky part of us. And we're going to get into some of these um, in terms of how they apply. But basically, when you stimulate these receptors like PPAR and the TRPV1 receptor, what it does is it ultimately decreases inflammation. These are receptors that regulate inflammation. And then another way that it has its beneficial effect is that it regulates the ability for the breakdown of our body's own endocannabinoid systems. This is really important because it keeps our own endocannabinoids in, our, uh, in that uh, receptor longer. And then I mentioned already the G protein receptors. They are kind of part of the CB, uh, maybe CB3 receptor you can, uh, you can talk about. Um, and then there is the effect that, um, that is called the entourage effect. And so it's important to point out that PA does not stimulate CB1 or CB2 directly. It has an indirect effect. And this is what that entourage effect means. So let's look at, look, look at what that is. Because a lot of people are going to be like, hold on here. How can it have a beneficial effect if it's actually not working on the receptors that I'm familiar with? Well, we've already talked about a number of the other receptors, but PEA enhances the whole ECS. It enhances the whole endocannabinoid system. So it's not just about it being the affecting molecule. It's about keeping the for example, our own endocannabinoid, AEA, for example, a very potent endocannabinoid. It prevents its breakdown, so it keeps it in doing its job longer. So I really love this, uh, this diagram, and you can find this diagram in the white paper PEA. It's available in your handout section uh, and also will be sent out to you as part of a follow-up email. But this white paper is an excellent resource that summarizes everything that I'll be talking about, and it has some great diagrams too. So I pulled this diagram from that, from that resource. And it really highlights these four unique ways that PA has its beneficial effects. So it has its effect by directly targeting, uh, targeting PPAR, which you can see here. And you can see the G protein receptors are also being targeted. Then PA is broken down by FAH, that particular enzyme. But by breaking, by using that enzyme, it also inhibits it, that enzyme. It, it, it basically keeps it occupied. So it allows AEA and 2AG, our body's own endocannabinoids, to do their job more. And they're the ones that are working on CB2 or CB1. And then in the D section, you can see it works on the capsation receptor. So that's directly on pain and inflammation. And then directly on the PPAR receptor. And PPAR goes down right to our nucleus, and it is responsible for regulating the production of anti-inflammatory genes. And those genes create proteins for anti-inflammatory anti proteins. So that's the way that it indirectly has a very potent effect right down at the genetic level. So I find the understanding where a particular substance comes from really, really important. And I think the story of PEA is, is really, really neat. So this molecule has been around for a really long time. Before World War II, Dr. Coburn, Coburn in, uh, in New York was looking at something to target rheumatic fever. Because at that time, rheumatic fever was a real issue, issue especially for the street kids uh, in New York. And they found that feeding them egg yolks, not the egg whites, but the egg yolks, reduced the incidence of rheumatic fever. And they, they isolated it down to this particular substance that was found in egg yolks. At that time, we didn't understand or they didn't know it was PA, but rheumatic fever uh, incidence went down dramatically after they were giving egg yolks. So there's something in this egg yolk. Fast forward almost 20 years, and now we actually have isolated PEA and um, when you look at it, I'll show you a chart in a second, the food sources of PA, one of the foods that are rich in PA is soy lecithin. Remember, it's, it's part of your cellular membranes. And we think of 
uh, fossil lipids and, and soy less than is, is rich in fossil lipids as a key builder for your cellular membranes. So after it was isolated in, in the 1950s, then in the 1970s, it was actually used as a pharmaceutical um, a pharmaceutical drug, and it was being used as uh, an immune modulator. And in the 1970s, there were almost uh, almost 4,000 participants that were done in, in previous former Czechoslovakia, and they were looking at it in both adults, and they also did a study on kids on specifically the common cold. And we'll look at this in a little bit more detail and explore this. But they found some really, really great results. You can see here, it's found in a lot of foods. And to me, that is really, really re reassuring. Uh, unlike actually cannabis and um, CBD and THC, this is found in plants. But when you find it in foods, it's different because that's really something that is going to be much better tolerated at higher doses when a person's consuming this. Typically, you have to do something extra to consume a herb, uh, like CBD or curcumin. And there's usually a bit more of a, a, safety, um, a safety profile that we have to consider. But when you find something that's really food source, like PEA is, and it's found in anything from human breast milk to common foods, uh, milks, uh, soy, tomato, pea, eggs, um, you can see that it's, um, it is something that's going to be quite safe. And we'll explore the safety at the end of the presentation. So there's this uh, doctor that really is, can be considered uh, a pioneer in the knowledge that we have now about PEA. Her name is Professor Rita Levi Montalacini, and she's from Italy. And a lot of the research on PEA comes from both Italy and Spain. They're kind of the pioneers on this. And they've um, and and Dr. Uh, Rita really focused in on understanding and. Um, and explaining what PA does on a pain relieving perspective and on an anti-inflammatory perspective. And she was specifically looking at pain states and mast cells, and we'll explore that, but mast cells as we now are beginning to understand play a key role in regulating neuropathic pain. It play a key role in uh, regulating neuropathic inflammation. So neurological inflammation, which we know can think of off the top of our heads, many conditions, anything from brain injuries to multiple sclerosis, they play a key role in, uh, in regulating that type of inflammation. And then since that, in the last 30 years or so, the uh, Spanish and Italian researchers have really produced a whole host of well-done clinical trials on PA for various types of chronic pain. And we'll look at that in a second. And there's lots of evidence to show that when the body is in imbalance when there's an illness or disease, PEA levels increase. So we know that PEA plays a key regulatory role. Uh, and then there's also been this term in the literature now that's more recently come out, and it's not, you know, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's carved in stone, but it's something that's interesting that there's this thing called the endocannabinoid deficiency. So in, in just like a neurotransmitter, something the body's always using to communicate, you can have a deficiency in endocannabinoids, if a person is using it and uh, in, in, a, in an excessive way, so they have tons of chronic pain, they have tons of inflammation, they have lots and lots of stress, and they don't have the right cellular membrane building blocks that can contribute to the production of uh, PEA and other endocannabinoid molecules. And that's been associated with, that deficiency has been associated with IBS, stress, psychological disorders, fibromyalgia, and many other conditions. So we have evidence to show that PEA is dysregulated in various on, on, uh, states that are we're not in homeostasis. So let's, um, and if you do have questions at this point, um, you, there will be answering them in the comments channel and I'll be answering them at the end. So please put them in, um, but we'll keep going here and then we'll answer questions at the end. So let's dive into clinical applications of PEA. Uh, and this is really where I think this molecule shines. Um, before we get into the research, um, we'll, we'll start with the immune system, but I'm just impressed by PEA itself. So we just learned about it, how it's part of our, our many foods that we're eating all the time. It was originally discovered as something found in food. Unlike something that is herbal, which I use herbs all the time, but this is something that the body normally produces. And now, 
if you go back to the true definition of orthomolecular medicine, like the godfathers of orthomolecular, uh, orthomolecular medicine, like Abram Hoffer and Louise Pauling and Matthias Rath, these, these um, legendary doctors really looked at orthomolecular medicine not by using herbals, by using molecules, vitamins, and minerals that are found naturally in food and the body normally either produces or needs for basic physiological function. That's the definition of a vitamin. It's needed by the body. And if you look at the function of PEA and you look at where it comes from, it's produced by the body, it really fits that definition of being a true orthomolecular or orthomolecular molecule or orthomolecule for short. So that's something that I think is really unique. And, and you can see that there's a, a tremendous amount of compatibility. From a research perspective, it's, it's really surprising that we haven't heard more about PEA. A lot of that has to do that a lot of the research was done in Europe and doesn't make its way over to North America as easily. But there's over 50 human clinical trials, over 300, almost 350 citations in PubMed, uh, the key uh, scientific database. And it's been researched for a really, really long time with an excellent safety profile. As you can see, there's no surprise, there's a real wide range of clinical applications. So let's, um, let's dive into some of those applications. And we'll start with the ones that are probably the most um, well-studied and originally was the, the reason why PA was studied uh, in Czechoslovakia. So remember, PA and immune system. CV2 specifically has a lot of, um, uh, has found a lot in the immune system. And so even though PA doesn't have a direct action on the immune system, it has a very indirect action through CB2 receptors, as well as through the whole endocannabinoid system. And this is what was understood back in the 70s, from 1972 to 1977. There were six large uh, randomized placebo-controlled trials, and they were looking at both treating um, short term, so like 12 days treating infections as well as preventing infections. And, and that was uh, done up to eight weeks. And they found that there was a reduction uh, in fever, coughs, colds, lost days at work, lost, uh, lost days from school, um, which was very, very promising. Um, and what was, what was great is that it was really, really well tolerated. So I just, uh, this slide just summarizes what I just mentioned. Um, it really was effective primarily for the fever, sore throat, cold, fatigue, malaise. Um, you know, flu would be a really, really great, um, I think, a great condition that PA would respond well from. It didn't um, respond as well to things like runny nose, uh, sinus congestion, some of the other upper respiratory tract infections. But it did address things like coughs, fever, fatigue. And that obviously has a huge role to play when it comes to lost days uh, from productivity. Because a lot of people don't want to go to work when they're feeling under the weather, um, they have a fever, but they might be able to push through with a, a, a runny nose. Um, and the best part is, is that it was uh, very, very well tolerated. Zero side effects were uh, improved, uh, were observed. And this is a great little reference a chart that shows you the particular studies that were done, uh, the size of studies, um, and and it really it really the dose varied as well, which was kind of neat. Um, whether it was uh, 600 milligrams uh, once as kind of a maintenance, or once or twice a day, uh, or up to three times a day as kind of acute in short term. So it was really looking at the complete um, the range, the complete dose range spectrum. You can see the the really um, great uh, percentage of protection by using PA compared to the placebo control group. So let's look at probably the second biggest one. And this is one that AOR specifically has a claim from Health Canada uh, when it comes to pain and when it comes to uh, inflammation. Analgesic is just a term for pain, anti-pain or pain blocking. Before we actually get into the studies, I think it's important to understand there's different types of pain, especially when it comes to the chronic. I'm not talking about, you know, you a person fell and sprained their knee, even though that would definitely apply here. The majority of, I think, the studies are looking at chronic pain. There's nociceptive pain, meaning there's damage occurring 
um, that, uh, that the receptors are sensing, like for example, bone on bone in osteoarthritis or gout with the uric acid crystals being deposited or tendinitis. This is more probably the acute side of things where something like neuropathic pain, like the top circle here, that's more of an impingement of a nerve like carpal tunnel, diabetic neuropathy, which is a chemical uh, neuropathy. And then you have neck pain, back pain, as those nerves coming out of the spine are, are becoming impinged, sciatica, for example. And then finally, the third category is hypersensitivity. And these are things like IBS, so it's almost like an irritation of the nerves of the intestines. Fibromyalgia has been linked to an irrit irritation of uh, small fiber nerves, nerves, restless leg syndrome, myofascial pain. So all three of these are different realms and there's conditions that have aspects of all three of these. But what's neat is that PEA addresses each one of these key areas, which I find, especially as a doctor with focus in these in chronic pain and neuro neurological conditions, extremely exciting. And I use a lot of magnesium. So you can see in the hypersensitivity, magnesium and curcumin might be some of the better uh, options, but PEA can be complementary to that, as well as in the neuropathic pain, you know, B12 in the AOR's new tri B12 synergy, um, or lipoic acid, PA is also going to have its effect on neuropathic pain, and then nociceptive, your typical osteoarthritis, tendonitis, and then, you know, things like Boswellia, curcumin, some of your other joint building blocks, and PA has a role to play there. So what I want to show you this diagram is that it has a role to play in all three of the major chronic pain uh, areas that uh, people might be dealing with. And these are the, uh, an expanded chart showing some of the particular conditions that each one of these areas look, uh, looks at. So um, I won't go through all of these, but um, anything from inflammation to chronic pain syndromes to pelvic pain syndromes, to rheumatic pain, like osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, PA has a role to play in all of these. So let's look at some of the studies, and I don't have time to go through all um, you know, 15 plus studies on chronic pain, there's some worth noting. Um, this particular study was looking at PA as an add-on therapy to an opioid, and here it's referred to as Tabentol. And you can see here, after three weeks, the pain score starts to decrease using PEA in the PEA group in combination with this opioid. And even though it was done over six months, the effect started after six weeks and it continued to go, uh, continued to go down. What was great about this, and as it applies to one of the most important in issues in our current healthcare system is, it reduced the dose of this opioid, which is incredibly helpful for the opioid crisis. So using a substance like PA can be very complementary to uh, using opioids. You don't have to use it just by itself. So this is the, the takeaway that I look at this is that it does improve low back pain, but it can also improve it if a person is taking other medications and it's synergistic, reducing the dose that's needed to have that pain. There's another study looking at fibromyalgia. This was done in 2015, again, showing that PEA and the UM or M starts, stands for ultra-micronized and micronized, and we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but um, you can see substantially reduced levels at the end of the study. And again, we're looking at that kind of um, two to three month mark in a lot of these studies. IBS, another type of nociceptive uh, and, um, and a, a type of pain that, that has aspects of almost all three. And again, in combination with another um, pharmaceutical medication at the end of the treatment, notice in the second, um, in the second due columns, you can see that there's a substantial reduction in the pain uh, and in terms of ab abdominal pain. So <clears throat> this chart is a really great summary and I really love showing this to docs when we chat about e uh, PEA. Um, you can see here, there's a really nice uh, smattering of sciatic pain. So lumbo uh, sciatica, a very common type of pain. This was using a fairly low dose, 300 milligrams twice daily. And AOR's uh, uh, formulation is 400 milligrams per cap and it's 90 capsules. Um, there's also a 600 milligram lozenge that is, out. so that's even just one day. In just 21 days, there was a significant uh, decrease in pain. Um, and then you can look at some of these um, in your own time, but 
a couple things to point out. A lot of double blind randomized placebo controlled trials. There was one that was in combination with a, a new generation NSAID, so celecoxib. Even though it wasn't as good as celecoxib, it was still uh, significantly reduced pain intensity. Uh, and we know celecoxib is going to have a whole host of uh, potential uh, side effects that uh, even a lot of the conventional medical doctors don't love prescribing this medication. TMJ, uh, pelvic pain. Um, so that is a huge issue that is often under uh, underserviced and underappreciated, but pelvic pain, there's neuropathic pain that has to do with it, post-pregnancy damage to uh, certain nerves like a uh, pudental nerve, for example. Uh, this is uh, this is something that other studies have been uh, being looked at, but if you look at the study, you can really look at the, the neuropathic and uh, the gnosis of the pain really having the, the strongest benefit here in the, in the top couple of rows. So in summary, 19 human clinical trials, five are randomized double-blind placebo-controlled, uh, PA is used by itself and in combination, which I think is very helpful, and it reduced a lot of the pain and reduce the usage of, of prescription drugs. This by itself should be a reason why everybody that's on chronic pain, anybody that's taking curcumin or boswellia uh, for chronic pain should also be taking PEA because there's a lot of synergy with both herbals and with, um, with pharmaceutical medications because they, they have complementary mechanisms of action. So we talked a little bit about inflammation. There are two ways that PEA reduces inflammation. We talked about mast cells. Mast cells are a key player in the inflammatory cascade. They produce histamine, they produce inflammatory molecules like chemokines and cytokines. These are molecules that happen to be released very quickly, especially in the acute stages of inflammation. And PEA regulates mast cells, preventing the overproduction of these particular uh, these particular molecules. Think of PEA as kind of a built-in break for the inflammation. So inflammation needs to be produced, but what is, what, is, what is the break? What is the regulator in the body that prevents the overproduction of inflammation? Well, PEA plays that role. It also stimulates PPAR alpha, which inhibits a key inflammatory molecule or actually transcription factor. And this is the big bad boy that we've talked about in curcumin lectures before, but the NF kappa beta. This is the nuclear factor kappa beta, which is a very, very strong pro-inflammatory, uh, pro-inflammatory signaling molecule. And by inhibiting this, we stop it from being produced at the genetic level. So specifically on the inflammatory side, we talked a little bit about osteoarthritis. There's a reduction in pain scores, and there was also a reduction in anxiety. Remember this as we talk about mood in, in a couple slides. Uh, and again, the doses are very similar, all in that 300 to 1200 range uh, on, a, on a daily dose. This was again looking at eight weeks in a fairly substantial amount of patients, over 100. And you can see here the 600 dose, which is the, 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 the darker line at the bottom, uh, that was 600 milligrams. That had the most significant significant effects, but it was not much different than 300 dose. So you can still get a very beneficial effect with a very moderate dose. And this is a very recent study. What about neurological conditions? I mentioned that. I mentioned neuroinflammation. So mast cells have a key role to play. I want to introduce you to a, a cell that you may or may not have heard of before, but they're one of the key central inflammatory cells of neuropathic and neurological inflammation. They're called microglia. They're the ones that spit out inflammation after a person's had a concussion. They're the ones that are uh, dysregulated in multiple sclerosis and a lot of the other neurodegenerative conditions and the neurotraumatic conditions, even something like stroke, for example. PA prevents the recruitment of these mast cells which regulate the microglia. You can see here this diagram, which is also found in the PA white paper. It shows how regulating PPAR, regulating a tumor necrosis factor uh, the, there is a crosstalk between mast cells and microglia, and PA is really good at regulating mast cells. Uh, specifically in neurological conditions, uh, stroke is one of those conditions that is a huge killer in, all, all around the world, uh, and there was a combination of PA and a flavonoid called lutololin, and they found that giving both of these together, again, I like this because there's a synergy with things that are found in foods and 
found in other herbs. And they found that giving people that had stroke had an improvement in neurological cognition, pain, spasticity, and quality of life, uh, and almost across the board. So this is something that's really, really exciting because there's not a lot of great things that we have in our arsenal post-stroke. I mentioned that PA improved anxiety in the osteoarthritis study. It also has a role to play in depression. Remember back to that first few slides that I showed you in that diagram with those two nerve cells. What the endocannabinoid system does is that it regulates the secretion of these neuro uh, signaling molecules, neurotransmitters, and they're the ones that typically are targets for the pharmacological drugs. And so when you have a system that is regulating the production, the secretion of neurotransmitters, like PEA does through the endocannabinoid system, you're going to have a more balanced transmission, you're going to have a more balanced mood. And it also helps decrease inflammation, as you can see here, through PPAR, which is one of the most important key processes that have been now linked to mood. So we haven't thought about this before, but depression and inflammation are linked. This is really important to understand. Same thing to do with anxiety and other what we consider psychological conditions. The combination also was really neat. And this study, again, looked at PEA plus a very common citalopram uh, antidepressant medication. And it was 1200 milligrams a day. And they found that there was a significant reduction in uh, a very standardized score called HAMD for depressive symptoms just after one month of using PEA compared to just using citalopram alone. So again, showing you that there's this complementary effect. Think of that PEA is kind of like, there's things that might be Batman, but PEA is Robin, where it's always complementing the, the effect of maybe the main player, but it has a powerful effect in its synergy in even by itself as well. And it also found, was interesting is that it had a faster effect than citalopram alone. One of the issues with antidepressants is that you have to actually wait four or six weeks before they quote unquote kick in. Um, and this has to do with the effect that they're trying to keep the uh, neurotransmitters in the, in, the, in the synaptic cleft between the two nerves longer. And so uh, PEA speeds up this process. And you can see again, that is the, uh, that is the, the graphic showing that improvement there. Again, another really uh, recent study. Autism. I won't talk too much about this, but that's probably one thing that maybe crossed your mind when it came to neurological conditions. This was, again, in combination uh, with risperidone, which is a medication that is used sometimes in, uh, in autistic patients. And PEA was studied not, not by itself, but in combo twice a day, 600 milligrams, and they found there was an improvement, again, that synergy that was happening. And again, it makes sense because there's an, a strong aspect of neuroinflammation in autistic uh, patients. So this was a neat study, very recent, 2018. Here's one that I did not expect. Uh, so PEA inflammation, PEA neuropathic pain, I think we can understand that when we look at the, uh, the receptors, specifically when it comes to you know what we know about cannabis. But PA's effect on other systems is actually even more intriguing, but it doesn't, it shouldn't surprise us knowing what we know about the way that it works on every single tissue in the body and it's produced out of the cellular membrane. There is a number of studies showing that PEA reduces gut permeability. And this was a very recent study and it was as effective as CBD. This is impressive. Wow. You know, that's something that um, we can really use because CBD, for all of its beneficial effects, some people can't handle it. Some people can't do CBD because of they travel to the U.S. because they work uh, in a job that you can't um, use this, or they have to uh, they have to have some sort of attention, focus, like a pilot, uh, police uh, officer, or, or so on and so forth. Um, there, so the influence of PEA similar to CBD on the microbiome is really, really neat. So this is uh, leaky gut, intestinal permeability. It also has a role to play in vitamin D deficiency, so complementary to our other orthomolecules like vitamin D. And it also has a role to play in the, the, the restoration of the healthy microbiome, like this acromancia, the bacteroides. These 
are the kind of the, the holy grail of probiotics and bacteria as we're trying to upregulate these. And we really we haven't seen too many acromancia probiotics that are that are feasible and viable, but PEA helps improve that because again, it doesn't circumvent the body's own physiology. It allows it to do what it normally does, similar to fiber. Fiber helps grow probiotics. So now prebiotics are becoming even more, I wouldn't say even more popular, but more popular than probiotics because they're actually getting closer to the root cause. The root cause being lower amounts of good bacteria. Well, let's fertilize them, let's feed them. In this case, let's actually feed them with our body's own regulating system. And you can actually see this in this diagram here. PA is one of the key gatekeepers when it comes to those tight junctions. Our intestinal lining is only one cell deep. You can just see that here, just the way I put my hands together. And if there's any sort of inflammation, if there's a deficiency in PEA, if there is an imbalance in probiotics, in the imbalance in the, in the mucilaginous layer, you're going to have increased permeability. And what's neat here is that PEA is one of the key regulators of leaky gut along with some of the other endocannabinoids. Uh, so something that we probably haven't thought about. And here's some other conditions that we probably haven't thought about for PEA before as well. So things like allergies, that makes total sense when it comes to the mast cell stabilization properties of PEA. Neurogenerative disease, migraines, uh, something that we did not touch on, but it is a pain, headaches, glaucoma. There's actually, I was reviewing this morning, there's quite a bit of research showing that glaucoma and other uh, ocular conditions, because remember, the nerves are, uh, the eyes are very rich in nerves, and things like glaucoma is pressure, ocular pressure on the, on the ocular nerve, and that ocular nerve is becoming damaged, and it's not allowed to have perfusion of blood. Anything that we can do to protect that nerve is what often is being done in, um, in conventional circles, and PA does that from a natural perspective. Things like high blood pressure, fatty liver, that PPAR alpha plays a huge role in metabolic syndrome. So things like hypertension, obesity, um, regulation of glucose, diabetes, um, and anything that has to do with that kind of cardiovascular world, PPAR alpha is very, uh, plays a key role. Uh, and then finally, cannabis dependency. Cannabis dependency is a little bit of a I'm going to say controversial topic. There's people that really are huge fans of cannabis and there's people that are really leery of it. But one of the things that I think people are suspicious of, of cannabis is we still don't really know the full effect of it on, on the whole endocannabinoid system. And there are some people that don't do well on it. You know, for example, children, you know, it's, it's, it has the same restrictions in Canada as alcohol. And so we have to, we have to look at are there, are there other options like PEA that have similar effects to CBD, but are not CBD? And in terms of dependence, similar to medications, using PEA may require a person to need less or lower amounts of CBD or THC because of the synergy that's, that is being had at the receptor level. So that's something to, that's something to consider when, uh, when we're looking at um, overuse of cannabis, and that, that is something that we have to be cognizant of. So let's talk practicality. Um, let's talk AOR's PA Activate. So that is the AOR um, formulation in the retail line, and there is a pro version of it as well. Um, 400 milligrams per capsule, 90 capsules, and so that gives you 1,200 milligrams a day, which is really, really uh, one of the top end doses in all the research studies that we looked at. Uh, there is a lozenge version that's 600 milligrams as well, and that is going to have that increased absorption. Uh, we there is a there is a theory that it may be absorbed through the lymphatic system because it's a it's it's a fat um, similar to the ways that uh, long vita curcumin is being absorbed because it's combined with coconut oil uh, and it's combined with a, a specific phospholipid. This I think may have a similar effect, and because you can chew it. It might be easier for some people that don't want to swallow capsules, and there may be a little bit of sublingual absorption and higher in the GI absorption as well. Um, the capsules are micronized, and, and what does that mean? That means that the 
level of the, the, the size of the molecule is made much smaller. And this is some of the innovations that the Italians, the world, research, the world leaders in PA research have done. And they've, they've found a way to make uh, PA have a greater solubility by shrinking the molecule, by basically milling it to the point that it's much, much smaller. And that is going to uh, dramatically improve uh, not just solubility, but also absorption. I mentioned that uh, P, the PA that AOR uses is from Italy, and so that's where it's manufactured. But the original raw material, material comes from Malaysia, from sustainably grown and sourced palm. Uh, palm is often uh, one of the things that are, is clear cut and, and throughout the world. But Malaysia, in this particular part of Malaysia, is one of the most responsible way, uh, ways of, of harvesting it in, in a very ecologically friendly way. Um, and, it's, and the source is palmitic acid from palm. The two claims that I mentioned are chronic pain and anti-inflammatory, but what we talked about today is many other conditions that PA could be very applicable to. So as to summarize the orthomolecular application, one thing that we talk about all the time at AOR is the four R's. The right molecule producing the right dose in the right place at the right time. This is why AOR's B complex is one of our number one bestsellers, and because it contains all the cofactor forms of the B vitamins. And very similarly, PEA really fits that definition of a true orthomolecule. It is produced all the time as the body needs it in the tissues that need it. But when you give it as a supplement, you are going to have an increased amount of that molecule that is needed if a person is in chronic pain, chronic stress, or any of the other conditions or processes that I mentioned. So really, it fits that definition even better than a lot of herbals that AOR is very known for, like curcumin, true orthomolecule. A couple take-home points that I've alluded to, but I want to drive home with you. Number one, it supports the endocannabinoid system without side effects. That's unlike what CBD, hemp, and cannabis are unfortunately known for. So I'm not saying that they're not effective. In fact, they're very effective in a lot, for a lot of people. But the fact is, is that they are exogenous. They are external. There is a stigma that's associated with that. There are limitations. There are legalities associated with that. Because this is not, PA is not a phytocannabinoid. It is an endocannabinoid. It is licensed as an NPN and 100% per, perfectly regulated and legal. Uh, it works on a lot of the same pathways as CBD, not directly, but indirectly. And that actually may offer a, a number of beneficial effects. Number one, it's safer. Uh, and because anytime you give a specific substance, like a drug that blocks a particular enzyme, instead of giving the good fat that, like omega-3s, that is responsible for an anti-inflammatory effect upstream, you, risk, you run the risk of having more side effects. That's a perfect example with CBD. Um, what's impressed me the most about a lot of the studies with PEA is the impressive safety profile when it comes to PEA. And some people just don't wanna take cannabis, and this is a great option for them to still get support for their endocannabinoid system, nourishment for that system, uh, especially if they're in a condition like chronic pain, chronic inflammation that needs extra support for the ECS. The safety profile, um, and we talked about NIOS, but it's been studied in children, it's been studied in athletes, it has that, that real big safety profile for all sorts of uh, uh, people, all ages and all walks of life. And then finally, there's a very specific therapeutic dose. One of the negative drawbacks of CBD and cannabis is that you kind of have to play with the dose. I see this with my patients all the time where they're kind of figuring out the exact strain, the exact ratio of THC to CBD. With PA, it's very simple. PA knows what it needs to do. It is designed through the endocannabinoid system, through the body's wisdom to do what it needs to do from whether it's inflammation or regulate stress, damage from UV rays, et cetera. And there's a very defined dose and therapeutic window. So anything from 300 milligrams in the research studies to 1200 milligrams, uh, and even more, both used acutely, as little as 12 days beneficial effect in, in immune function, and 21 days in chronic pain. And something like sciatica, for example. 
So really, PEA is a quintessential uh, orthomolecule, and the applications are really, really broad. I want to point out, lastly, that don't let the broad spectrum of applications actually throw you off. We've had some people say that, well, how can something be so good for so many different things? Well, first of all, when you understand the endocannabinoid system, it's not a surprise that so many things can be, be can be affected. Number two is that, yes, there's a large list here in this diagram, but there's a couple that are probably the most evidence-based when it comes to inflammation, when it comes to neuropathic pain, when it comes to mood, uh, and some of the neurological conditions. That's probably a great place for us to start. And think of it as a compliment to anybody that is going to find some looking for curcumin uh, on the shelves. They're looking for Boswellia. You're giving them uh, eggshell membrane protein. You're giving them chondroitin, MSM, glucosamine. PA complements all of those things because none of those particular substances work on the endocannabinoid system. So it's the quintessential synergistic molecule. So thank you so much for, uh, for listening. We are going to have some quick questions here. Uh, and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer as many of those as possible for you. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for that informative presentation and the downloading us with all of your knowledge on the PEA. Um, we're actually running tight on time here. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually compile all the questions because we've already received so many amazing questions. Um, and we will we'll put our answers to those questions and we'll distribute them with the follow up email along with the recording of this presentation and the white paper that you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Awesome. So if anyone has had a chance or not had a chance to present their questions in the question box, um, either for Dr. Herkel specifically about this presentation or if it's about another AOR product, you can email them to marketing at AOR.ca. So that's M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G at AOR.ca. Um, likewise, if you haven't had a chance to send us your phone number and address for your free sample, please do that and send it to the marketing at AOR email as well. I'd also like to let everyone on the line know about our next upcoming webinar, which will be on October 8th at noon Eastern. Um, Dr. Chantel Dumas will be presenting on strategies to balance mood and hormones. So if you're not yet registered for that, you can sign up at AOR.ca. And otherwise, thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us. And thank you again, Paul, for such a great presentation. My pleasure. Thank you, guys.